Good evening, everyone. We ask you to please stand as we welcome our honored guests and dignitaries. They'll be piped in from the back. Thank you, and please be seated. As we gather here tonight, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Now, without further ado, we'd like to officially welcome you to the 42nd Annual C.J. McKenzie Gala of Engineering Excellence. Tonight, we have the amazing honor of being your MCs. My name is Shanti Bergen, and this is Andrew Talind. We are all here tonight because in some way or another, engineering means something to us. Whether that is because of the job we have, our interest in taking things apart, or our significant other is really good at math. Tonight we celebrate this profession that has an impact on everything that we do. This year, the Department of Mechanical Engineering has the privilege of hosting the C.J. McKenzie Gala. As such, Andrew and myself are here to represent the undergraduate and graduate mechanical engineers. We would like to welcome all the dignitaries, industry leaders, alumni, faculty, and of course, friends of the College of Engineering as well as the over 300 undergraduate and graduate students who are with us this evening. Also, people who say things are free have obviously never drawn a free body diagram or created an event like this. I like the engineers laughed at that one. <laughs> Therefore, this evening would not be possible to possible without the support of our sponsors. Please join me in thanking our title sponsor, Graham Construction, our presenting sponsor, Co-op Refinery Complex, and our gold sponsors, ASL Paving Limited and Devon Energy. Thank you to everyone for being here at, on this evening as we celebrate this wonderful engineering tradition at the U of S. We would like to encourage you to share your time here with others via social media, of course, using the hashtag CJM2018. Now, there are also some very limited edition Snapchat filters for you to enjoy if you allow the location on your app. And um, now, in the off chance that you have no clue what a hashtag 
or what a filter is, um, go ahead, feel free to consult the very tech-savvy generation sitting at your table. Um, they'll be happy to fill you in, specifically the undergraduate students. Remember that, because the graduate students, they don't seem to leave their office too much. <laughs> that might be true, but remember who marks your lab reports. Andrew and I have both appreciated coming to CJ McKenzie Galas in past years. One thing we both realized from being students here is that people in industry have a lot of insight to offer us. We like to encourage you to take this evening to learn from those people. Find out how they did it and what didn't work. Try to figure out where you will be in 5, 10, or 30 plus years. And what is so neat about this gala is usually once they were in the same spot you are tonight. Even our distinguished lecturer, Mike Marsh, he was once in second semester of second year just like Andrew. The CJ McKenzie Gala of Engineering Excellence has a very rich and vibrant history within the College of Engineering. Beginning in 1976, Dr. Mel Hossein, who's with us this evening, and Dr. Joe Chadobiak started an annual Distinguished Graduate Lecture Series in the College of Engineering. Now on its 42nd iteration, this is the college's flagship annual event and has an established re reputation as being the leading engineering gathering here in Saskatoon. It is a chance for the college to recognize alumni who have reached a special level of achievement within the engineering profession. On the lecture's 10th anniversary, it was renamed the Chalmers Jack, or CJ, McKenzie Gala in honor of the first dean of the College of Engineering. In addition to being the first dean of our college, CJ McKenzie is known for designing and building Saskatoon's unique Broadway bridge that you saw on the screens behind you earlier a project which helped the unemployed during the Great Depression. He was a leader in developing nuclear research by spearheading Canada's nuclear development as president of the Atomic Energy Board in 1948. In 1984, however, when C.J. McKenzie passed away, the college adopted the McKenzie dress tartan as its own, as shown by the one Sean T. and I are wearing this evening. By wearing this tartan, we honor the legacy that C.J. McKenzie has left with the college and with the engineering profession as a whole. This evening's celebration are about the great work of people. From C.J. McKenzie to our distinguished lecturer this evening and the many others here in our audience tonight. It's about celebrating the dedication of engineers to our true work. It's about learning from each other and how we can better utilize the skills that we have to serve the world. This evening is about standing by one another and actively seeking opportunities to collaborate to accomplish great things. Now we will kickstart the program with hearing from the University of Saskatchewan's Provost and VP Academic, Dr. Tony Vanelli, to bring greetings on behalf of our great university. Welcome everyone. What a, what a great introduction by these two. Why don't we congratulate for what they have done. Um, I've been, um, I'm going to deviate a little bit from the speech. I've been really blessed in, in my life. These were tall people. I, I'm, I'm kind of short here. Um, I've been very blessed in my life to actually be involved with people who always want to make impact and engineers are exactly that, along with the wonderful scientists, social scientists, innovators, arts people that we have at this wonderful university that I'm blessed to sort of be involved with as, as the new provost in the last six months. It's just a great institution. And with what we have tonight and on at the C.J. McKenzie Gala, we some, have something very unique in terms of the power of engineering, which I know quite well, and how it can become an enabler for what we want to do as this in this wonderful province that we are fortunate to live in that will be a, a key driver for the future that we know uh, is coming. So we really want to celebrate that and in, in an honoring our guests tonight and all of you 
it's just a pleasure to be here, to be part of this. It's really, uh, you should see up here how it really feels. I've been in a number of these in Eastern Canada, and I can tell you this one blows it away, so uh, good on you. Now, this annual event, uh, <laughs> absolutely, and you should take some pride in that. This annual gala is an important event for the College of Engineering. Uh, I'm also a member of the College of Engineering. I'm pleased to be here to welcome a number of special guests tonight. The Honorable Herb Cox, uh, the Minister of Advanced Education and the Ministry of Education, who's here at my table. Uh, I would also like to uh, um, uh, cite uh, Cliff Toppinson and uh, Brad Darbyshire from the Saskatoon Tribal Council and Elder Louis Louise Alf, who's also here uh, this evening. I'd also like to uh, thank Darren Hill, the counselor with the city of Saskatoon, for being here. Uh, it's really good to see uh, fellow U.S. Uh, University of Saskatchewan colleagues here tonight, including our newly minted uh, Dean of Engineering, Suzanne Cresta, who I'm pleased to have here uh, guiding the college for the next uh, many years. Um, many engineering faculty, staff, and students are here tonight. Uh, our two student MCs who just did a fabulous job, Shanti and Andrew, uh, will, will drive this the rest of the night, so thank you for doing that. I want to also say a special welcome to our sponsors this evening who made this, uh, this event possible, including, including Graham Construction, Co-op Refinery, ASL Paving, and Devon Energy. I'd like to recognize June Verhulst, uh, VP of Construction with Graham, and look forward to hearing her remarks soon. While this is my first time attending the C.J. McKenzie Gala, it is certainly not the first I've heard of it, and this is true. This event has an excellent reputation both on and off the campus across this country. Since starting as provost uh, in August, I've gotten to know many people from uh, each of the university's academic units and learn more about the interesting and innovative work being done on all corners of this wonderful campus. Through all my conversations, I've come to un understand exactly how my home college of engineering stands out. The college's rich and strong history over the last 100 plus years is very unique in what it's achieved. It is a hard work, it is defined by a very hard working and determined nature in its students, staff, and faculty that is a big part of its success. The high standard of work and excellence in teaching and research is exemplary and is, leads this university. The noticeable talent of its people who go on to become distinguished alumni, many of you are here tonight, uh, and including our guest speaker, are spectacular. And finally, the unspoken and lasting connection that engineering alumni have with the college and their commitment and loyalty is unique in this country and it is unique about industry professionals, which this, uh, this dip discipline is about. Tonight's gala is an opportunity to recognize and celebrate these accomplishments, and, it's imp and it is impressive tonight that it is the 42nd time that the college has come together to celebrate its proud history. This evening we will honor the great work of, of, in, of one particular engineer, Mike Marsh, uh, who is our distinguished lecturer tonight. Mike is the president and CEO of SAS Power, one of the province's most important crown corporation and a valued partner with the University of Saskatchewan. Mike graduated from the University of Saskatchewan in 1979 with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, which sparked a long career in construction and operations and eventually led to management and leadership roles for him that he's achieved spectacular levels. In addition to supporting engineering students each year through SAS Power Industry Awards, one of the most recent and notable projects that SAS Power supports at the University of Saskatchewan is the Senior Industrial Research Chair position in Smart Grid Technologies, which is the future of power in this province and country and world, held by Professor Tony Chung. This is a $2.2 million chair position, which is supported by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada and SAS Power. SAS Power also made a 10-year investment in Dr. Chung's research program, which focuses on creating safe and sustainable power, power grid 
that includes renewable energy sources. Now, why is this important? This province, led by initiatives like Dr. Chung and his team, will be moving towards 50% of the energy b uh, being generated from renewable so resources by 2030. That's not far away, folks, and that is impressive. As a student enrolled in the College of Engineering years ago, I suspect that Mike couldn't have predicted where his engineering degree would take him or that it would lead him to head a major organization involved in such very important work. I want to recognize and thank our valued partners at SAS Power and all of our industry partners this evening for your vision, leadership in your respective fields, as well as your ongoing support of our students. It was just spectacular watching what was out there uh, to your left uh, this evening and who will become the next generation of engineers and will be sitting here for many years to come. Mike, sincere congratulations on being named the 42nd Annual C.J. McKenzie Distinguished Lecturer in Engineering Excellence. I look forward to hearing more about a future with sustainable uh, electricity in your lecture tonight, and I hope all the students in the crowd also see the opportunities that lay before them to make a difference like you, you have. As we face social sciences and uh, social challenges in our cities, in our environment and in our society, we need engineers more than ever to find solutions to the pressing problems. I issue a challenge tonight of where we could go. We, we have three pillar, three points of a triangle that are gonna be very important to our future. I'm gonna deviate just for a moment. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's about planetary health, which we've, we are talking about quite extensively at this university, including tomorrow, with all our deans getting together to talk about major initiatives. And engineering will be a key driver of this. Planetary health are three parts of a triangle that are driven by water, by food that this universe, university does in spectacular fashion, and energy which I've just talked about, and Mike, who we are honoring tonight, SAS Power, among many involved in that. Our planetary health involves us protecting what's in the inside those points and the triangle and everything outside it. It is important that we drive to that direction, and this province, this university, could be the main driver for that success. It is a huge challenge for us to achieve and leads to really the well-being of every citizen in this province, in this country, and in the world if we don't take this challenge on. And I am challenging engineering to do what it does best, is lead by example and solve this so that we move to that better position. So that's really what I'm hoping we can do. As a university, we're here to support you and prepare you for the world after graduation. So I'm speaking to the students now. The education you will receive here at this university is one of the highest in the, uh, the country. We care about your education, we care about your success, and the investment that the ministry and others make in industry to your education and success impacts everyone inside this province and in this country. It broadens what we do with engineering. The College of Engineering here at the University of Saskatchewan, as well as its partner colleges and schools, as a university as a whole, has a long and proud history of graduating hardworking, curious, smart, and creative alumni who go on to make big impact in our community, our province, and beyond. And it is worth celebrating. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Vanelli. Our title sponsor, Graham Construction, has been a long-standing supporter of this evening. And without them, an evening like this would simply not be possible. Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, June Verhelst, Vice President of Construction for Graham.
Graham is pleased to partner with the College of Engineering for the 42nd annual CJ McKenzie Gala. In uh, 2012, we had our own uh, Ron Graham up here as the distinguished uh, lecturer, and I want to congratulate uh, Mike Marsh on his, uh, his appointment as a distinguished lecturer. We're really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And as a point of note, uh, SAS Power is the oldest customer of Graham Construction. Ron and Jane uh, travel here every year. Um, we meet up at the Christmas party that Graham has, and they ask about CJ McKenzie, and they travel from far to come here for this event, and we're really proud to have them with us. We believe that the College of Engineering is a valued partner, and uh, we applaud this effort to bring in industry professionals to meet the students and to collaborate. Um, Graham hires U of S engineering graduates for its projects, and we use them through project development. We use them through construction. We use them on elements of design. We use them for elements of completion and maintenance. And so uh, engineers can go upstream on these projects and downstream, and uh, they can enter the world of engineering, or they can enter the world of finance or business. Uh, they can do anything. and. Uh, one of the things that we talk about when we have our strategy meetings year over year is we talk about our prairie values and we talk about the work ethic and we talk about the roots of that work ethic and we talk about Saskatchewan and we talk about the College of Engineering. And so it's, it's common for people that want to stay local to work for Graham. It's a, it's a great opportunity local. We always have a full suite of projects in every industry. And then there's opportunities for people to go across North America with Graham, including to the U.S. So it's uh, wherever you, I guess, whatever interests you, uh, many disciplines, um, there's a lot of opportunities out there for engineers. And I would just say that when I graduated, uh, it was a recession. And I actually pounded ground rods for SAS Power for my first summer of employment. And um, over time, the opportunity came to work on a project, and then I was hooked on project work. So I would just say that uh, the economy is recovering. It looks like things are coming back. Saskatchewan has a bounce back, um, and so do the other industries. And so I would just say that uh, the employers are here, the industrial people are here, the buildings people are here. Everyone's here looking for U of S grads, and so uh, students, please don't waste the opportunity to talk. And maybe this year, the capital funding is going to be approved a little bit later on work and uh, initiatives. So maybe don't be discouraged if you haven't got landed the perfect job yet, because I think the capital will start to be released and people will start go out looking for people that are a fit. So Graham meets with the College of Engineering regularly and talks about things about the college, and we talk more recently, we're talking about diversity and Indigenous um, initiatives, and even tonight, uh, the new dean, Suzanne Cresta, was talking about uh, women in engineering, and I don't think about that very much because we have a lot of women on our team and we've all sort of come up through engineering, but I think that there is an opportunity for initiatives around all groups of connecting industry, uh, business people, men, women, indigenous, and trying to have a conversation about what, how we can make these U of S graduates even more valuable in the future. So thanks everyone. Thank you very much, June. Known for her awards in teaching excellence and leadership in the academic community, she has become an individual who puts the training of the next generation of professional engineers at the, as a top priority. Please help me welcome, for the first time ever at a CJ McKenzie Gala, our brand new Dean of Engineering, Dr. Suzanne Cresta. I think we're having a contest tonight for the shortest speaker. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm thrilled to have you here, thrilled to welcome you to Prairie Land. Um, just a fabulous crowd and a fabulous event. 
I also want to thank Shanti and Andre Andrew for that introduction. I have been, since my interview, consistently impressed by how our student leaders present themselves to college leadership. And I hope that all of you have a chance to meet and talk with some of our students tonight at your tables, at the club event, and just mingling around because I think they are fabulous and I'm really delighted to be here with them. As Dean, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 42nd annual CJ McKenzie Gala. Um, as we gather here tonight, we acknowledge that we gather on the traditional lands of the Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationships with one another. I'm honored to introduce and welcome our special guests, Elder Louise Hoff, the Honorable Herb Cox, Minister of Advanced Education, member of the Legislative Assembly, Gord Wyant, representing Saskatoon Tribal Council, Cliff Tapieson, Industrial Relations, and Brad Derbyshire, President and CEO of STC Industrial Contracting. Darren Hill, Ward 1 Councillor with the City of Saskatoon, Leah Hennecke, Chair of the U of S Board of Governors, Tony Vanelli, U of S Provost and Vice President Academic. Thank you for your remarks and for bringing a very broad perspective on the impact that we can have on the world. That's going to stay put. It is a very great privilege to serve as your dean and to host over 650 guests at this flagship event for our remarkable college. The community values of this very, very special province are a hallmark of our graduates, many of whom welcomed me to Alberta when I moved to the prairies 26 years ago. Tonight would not be possible without the support of a number of important people. As we've already mentioned, our sponsors, Graham Construction, Co-op Refinery, ASL Paving, and Devon Energy. Thank you for your generous support, which makes it possible for us to celebrate our honoree and to share this wonderful evening. Second, I'd like to thank our planning committee who tackled this event with such enthusiasm and care. Carlene Deutscher, Sam Smith, and Emily Bocking. What a fabulous, fabulous job they've done. Second, I'd like to acknowledge this year's host department, Mechanical Engineering. Rick Retzlaff and Ross Welford have been instrumental in pulling this event together. Now, I know you were curious about the new face at the helm of your beloved college, but I also know I'm not the only reason you're all here tonight. The C.J. McKenzie Gala gives us the opportunity to honor individuals who have made a significant impact in our lives, in our communities, and in the greater world. We're proud to recognize these outstanding people as alumni of our college. As you know, I am new to the college, which means I've had many entertaining moments trying to find my way around the engineering building. If you haven't found it yet, I urge you to take a moment to admire the Alumni Wall of Distinction and notice that it's right across from the elevator to the Dean's office, strategically placed so that every visitor to the college has the opportunity to learn about our alumni. The C.J. McKenzie honorees are impressive people. They have shaped society, built bridges between technology and health, aviation and safety, leadership and engineering, and so much more. I am thrilled to have four of these individuals with us this evening. Now, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's honoree, Mr. Mike Marsh, CEO of Sask Power, our distinguished lecturer and our newest inductee into the college's alumni wall of distinction. I've had the opportunity to learn about Mike and his friendship with the college over the past few months. In fact, 
That friendship was one of the first things that Don Bergstrom talked to me about when I first met Don in July. Mike is a mechanical engineer who has served as a role model to the college, showing us what it means to be a leader and sharing his vision of the value of service, working hard to make his community even better. Mike, I look forward to working with you in the coming years as we share exciting times ahead. I want to thank you for your support of the college. Your company gives back through financial support of the research chair, which Tony talked about. And I think this is an instrumental part of building the future, the three, the three corners of the triangle, food, water, and energy. Um, you give generously of your time and energy. Last year, Mike collected two of his friends and they came and hosted a leadership event for our students. The house was packed with over 300 students. And those events have a real impact on our students' education, and they're the kind of thing that we remember for many, many years after the thermodynamics textbook has been left on the shelf. You share your passion and advocacy for higher education by being involved with our students, welcoming them into your company and giving them an opportunity to prove what they can do. There is nothing more valuable that our leaders can do than give young people an opportunity to prove themselves. And I wanna thank everybody here tonight who's involved with our internship program, who employs our graduates, who encourages students. Mike, I'm so pleased to have you here as our distinguished lecturer and welcome you as the newest member of our Alumni Wall of Distinction. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to your wife, Maureen, your children, Jeff and Carrie, and your parents, Raymond and Elvira, and your sister, Barb, and her husband, Randy. Thank you for making the trip to join us tonight. I know you have a lot of other supporters in the crowd tonight who are eagerly waiting to see you take center stage. I want to thank everybody who traveled here from out of town. I know that that can be a challenge in the winter and that the conditions between Edmonton and Saskatoon this morning were a bit foggy. So, one of the privileges of the Dean is to celebrate outstanding accomplishments. And before I move on to a few words about what I see for the future of the college, I wanna call your attention to two very distinguished alumni who are with us here tonight, Kay Nasser and Warren Orr. In December, Kay and Harold were appointed to the Order of Canada, one of Canada's highest civilian honors. Please join me with a round of applause to recognize Kay and Harold. We are beyond proud to call you both not only alumni, but true friends of our college and the University of Saskatchewan and truly remarkable engineers. this event in December where the college has an opportunity to cook treats for our students and I wasn't actually here in December but I was so charmed that I actually did bring cookies and I was truly truly blown away that Kay Nasser actually cooked and brought food for the students that same day this is just a remarkable place Next, I'd like to ask all the members of our Western Engineering Competition team to stand. One, two, three. I think there should be about 13 of you all together. Don't sit yet. I got an email last weekend from Burnaby, BC. One of those things that you anticipate as the new dean, but you don't think it's going to happen quite that quickly. Uh, not, it turns out, to tell me as the new dean that some of our students needed to be bailed out of a predic predicament, but to share the news that U of S students placed on the podium in five of the seven Western engineering competitions, and 40% of our delegation qualified for the national competition in Toronto in March. This is just a remarkable outcome. A 
Okay, you can sit down now. It is wonderful to see our students thriving in their fields, challenging others to rise to the occasion, and in turn living up to the statement that engineers serve the world. Finally, I want to recognize the hard work and long hours being invested by all of our students who are here tonight. We may not always show it, but we care deeply about your success. <laughs> We're unreasonably proud of all of you, so thank you. Now, I do want to take a moment to speak about the future of our college and of our profession. At the very end of my two-day interview last May, the panel of about 15 people looked at me and asked, at the end of this, how are you feeling? And I looked at them, and my answer was immediate, inspired. I was inspired by the people I met and spoke with, inspired by the game-changing problems being tackled at this institution, and inspired by the deep sense of connection and beauty of this campus. I am delighted and honored to serve as your dean and to share in the discovery of our path forward for at least the next five years. During that time, we will contribute to solving some truly important problems. We will also drive a space of innovation by placing our ideas and curiosity in the context of Saskatchewan's communities and economic needs. In tandem with participating as full partners in a culture of innovation, we are committed to providing an outstanding education for the next generations of engineers. We have a team looking at transformation of our first year engineering program as I speak and I'm very excited by some of their ideas. Like our college, the engineering profession is in a moment of transition. Canada has major infrastructure projects which need to move forward, but are stalled by a public which is hearing many conflicting voices and is concerned by the impact of these developments. The path forward is unclear. As your dean, one of my touchstones is that bridges are more powerful than walls. When we're working with stakeholders, when we're collaborating in multidisciplinary teams, and when we're building inclusive communities, we need to build bridges towards each other, not walls that keep us apart. As engineers, we seek to build bridges of understanding across this gulf but persuasion and facts don't always change minds and hearts. And indeed, this was a problem even in the days of our very first dean. The promise to work, supervise, and design so that communication between people shall be free and full and in God's good time perfect the world through is part of the beautiful and stirring Iron Ring ceremony. This is not a new problem. On this note, I want to introduce all of you to another bridge, the Confederation Bridge linking PEI to New Brunswick. This is a beautiful bridge, perfectly suited to its surroundings, designed by another engineer from the prairies. I might add that our Lisa Fel Dr. Lisa Feldman was involved with part of the bridge design in one of her very first jobs and continues her research on concrete structures. I would also add that the most sensitive parts of the bridge were positioned using GPS technology that was new and innovative at the time, partly developed by another lady dean from PEI, Dr. Elizabeth Cannon. The things that we do change the world and they make their way outside the walls of the institution. What's remarkable about this bridge, though, is that in spite of the fact that it removed a two to six hour wait for the ferry, in spite of the fact that it reduced the travel time from a full hour to a scant 17 minutes, the project was strongly opposed and was eventually the subject of a hotly debated referendum. My father was strongly for and my mother was strongly against. One of the more compelling arguments put forward 
by highly educated people was that the bridge would change the island way of life. The proponents listened and learned, adjusted and responded, and stayed the course. The outcome, finally, was 59% in favor of the fixed link, which is now a beloved and iconic part of the landscape. Today, just as C.J. McKenzie built a bridge across the South Saskatchewan River, and Joe Giz, who was the first immigrant premier of the province of Prince Edward Island, found the will to build the Confederation Bridge, we're building bridges to our sister colleges at the University of Saskatchewan and to welcome diversity within our own corridors. These partnerships are not always easy. They challenge us to grow beyond what is and into what might be. The Ron and Jane Graham School of Professional Development, the Huff, Seaman, Barbhold and Laborde Chairs, and countless other truly visionary gifts from our alumni and former deans have put the foundations in place for us to continue to educate the leaders of tomorrow with our eyes firmly fixed on the future. As your dean, I respectfully ask our Indigenous partners and communities to help us learn their culture of listening and to share a conversation grounded in mutual respect and humility. I welcome them here tonight as we work to find a path forward together. I invite all of you to look to C.J. McKenzie and the many other leaders who built our college, to tonight's very special C.J. McKenzie inductee, Mike Marsh, and our other honored guests. They have all dared to build a vision for a better future and change the world we live in today. Thank you very much. Please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Dean Cresta. Before we begin this evening's dinner service, I would like to welcome Elder Louise Half to the stage. Now, before she takes the stage, I would like to recognize the utmost respect we have for our elders and knowledge keepers. It is customary to offer a gift of tobacco to an elder as a, as a symbol of gratitude and thankfulness for the knowledge that they share. Tobacco is a sacred gift that allows prayers and blessings to be carried to everyone's respected creator. In this gesture, tobacco is passed from the left hand to the elder's left hand while shaking right hands. This symbolizes that when hands and gifts join, it forms the Métis infinity symbol to pay respect to our Métis elders, but also shows that tobacco is a gift from the heart. So as we gather here this evening to feast and to celebrate, I would formally like to invite Elder Louise Half to the stage with this offering of tobacco and express our sincere gratitude for her blessing. I see no cowops to go on a check. Give day a visto and in a gano tetsig. Exnama, exnama, gui, cock dancy, sick, yes, open a meguma, manat soon. I always speak my language first in Cree to reaffirm that you are on Treaty Six territory in Metis land and that Cree is my language, my first language and I stumble through it as well as I stumble in English as well. Um, 
One of the biggest teachings that my elders have, um, first of all, I'd like to say what a prestigious crowd, and I'm very honored to be among you. Thank you. Uh, one of the greatest teachings my elders have taught, taught us and talked about is the longest journey that you'll ever take, and it is the hardest one. And it is from the, the journey from the head to the heart. You've made a very difficult contribution in your vision quest in achieving what you have done with this, this great gift of, of um, uh, the vision that you c carried forth from birth because that's where it all began, is from the birthplace. I want to, to acknowledge the elders in this group and the elders that have walked before you who have gifted you with this gift of knowledge and the ability to walk it forth. And also I noticed that you have the beaver as one of your totems. And of course the, to uh, the, the beaver is the greatest engineer above all. I bet you can compete with him. And it also tastes really good. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is invite you to say a prayer with me, and I'll do it in my language. And it is to, um, to thank the great mystery for the life that is granted to you because it is on whole. And for the breath of the wind, it is uh, also um, a privilege to be uh, breathing the wind. And um, one of your elders mentioned the water, the force of the water that you were born from. We'll give thanks to the water, and we'll give thanks to the fire because that's where the place where our soul is enkindled. And um, I give thanks to the land and to the rock, which is the backbone of this earth, and uh, to all the ha um, people who prepared the dinner. Um, I say thank you to you, and I'll say it in my language. So please. Um, Join me in your own special way to the great mystery, however you define it to be. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Ana mama wita wina kita naskum kita nuskadi sekarang. Ete ete wita pema keko keka waska matcek wisto aw ekwe hupiki na gehan ma kami asik meskano kita naskum na awami na mitu nu makawi asami ane kawi na nuski ego. Thank you. And enjoy your meal. I'm hungry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elder Louise Half. The event committee wants to pay special thanks to Mike Marsh's educational journey, as well as his contributions to the engineering industry here in Saskatchewan and beyond with the decorations you see here this evening. Now, if you haven't seen the centerpieces yet, that's because they need to be assembled. Um, they're a puzzle that has been designed uh, using the laser cutting machines here at the College of Engineering. Um, the hope this evening is that you can see the value of collaboration by putting these together. Thank you so much as well to Heather Torvey for the beautiful poem that explains the significance of our centerpieces this evening. Let's give her a round of applause. Once the centerpiece is complete, you'll notice a set of planetary gears that rotate around the top of the glass. These symbolize the interconnection of engineers. Just like that of a gear, as it has to do its own job, engineers must utilize teamwork to accomplish a task. You'll notice the shape of the beaver on the side, the mascot of the College of Engineering, which is a representation of the industrious and resourceful nature of engineers. Now lastly, for most of you of course, um, 
the entire structure is made of wood, representative of the strong, historic, and deep roots that our college and university have within the engineering community, much like those of a tree. And now it's time to eat. <laughs> Just a couple of reminders, it'll be a served plated meal prepared by the head chef at Prairie Land Park. Feel free to remain seated during the dinner and converse with your fellow table mates. There's also a card on your table for a complimentary bottle of wine, but additional bottles can be purchased at the bar. We will be providing reminders when we'll transition into Mike Marsh's lecture, uh, so just enjoy your evening for now. Thank you. Um, oh, okay, yep, that's me. Okay. Hello again, if you guys could find your seats, that would be excellent. We would like to start off by thanking the chefs, the kitchen staff, and the servers. That meal was stupendous, and they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> now for the highlight of the evening. We have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished lecturer, Mr. Mike Marsh. Long before Mike became the CEO of SAS Power in 2015, he was an engineering student at the U of S. From his years in engineering, he remembers a lot of things many of the students here tonight will be all too familiar with. Having late night study sessions, thinking all electricals do is play with three wires, having favorite profs, and building design projects. Where in Mike's case, his capstone project was an energy recovery system under the advisement of SAS Power. But what made his experience at U of S unique was that Mike and Maureen not only got married while Mike was in his undergrad, but they also welcomed their first son while Mike was in his third year of engineering. So Mike's study sessions now included a little guy bouncing around in a jolly jumper. So as a side note, if you're currently in engineering and you don't have a kid, then you definitely have some time to do your studies. Now, choosing mechanical engineering was largely based on his interest in thermodynamics, power creation, and his past work experience, which all have an influence on where he finds himself today. Andrew and I got the chance to meet with Mike and his lovely wife, Maureen, for coffee prior to this evening, and we are absolutely blown away by Mike's humble personality. Although his career is a major part of his life, Mike has been continually a part of many aspects of engineering. He's been on the Safe Saskatchewan board, the Canadian Nuclear Association Board, APEG's Investigation Committee, and a part of the Leaders Council for the Loran Scholarship. So it's safe to say that Mike has a love of the engineering profession as a whole, and we are very excited to hear from him this evening. We want to also make mention of Mike's wonderful wife, Maureen, who not only has a degree in nursing, but also two PhDs, which stands for Put Hubby Through, <laughs> for her outstanding moral and probably sometimes emotional support during my, both of Mike's undergrad and MBA. They make such a good pair, and we enjoy getting to know them both. Now please give a big engineering welcome to your very own Mike Marsh. set this over here. I brought uh, my own binder and as every lecture goes, 74 slides should be about right. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for that introduction, Shante and, and Andrew, that was very nice. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, Minister, uh, Dean Suzanne Cresta, faculty and staff alumni, and all the students, both undergrad and, and postgrad from the College of Engineering. And ladies and gentlemen, I am really most grateful to be receiving this recognition this evening. It is, it is really truly an honor, and I thank the College of Engineering and all of those who have been involved. We know there have been hundreds, if not, well, thousands actually, of graduates from this college who have gone out into the workforce over the past decades and have made significant contributions to their field of study, their companies, and their communities. In the process, they have raised and cared for families, built and developed organizations and the people who work in them, and many have accomplished great things along that way. 
I really have never considered what I've been involved in or what I have accomplished as anything special. I, I've just worked hard, been fortunate to have been part of many teams and to have worked alongside many talented people along the way. Many of them are in the room here tonight. I've always tried to bring a positive attitude to the workplaces I've been in and to really stay focused on achieving the objectives and goals that need to be achieved to move departments, organizations, and even industries forward over time. I'd like to take a quick moment as well just to uh, thank my family, my parents and brothers and sisters for their support over the years. The biggest thank you must really go to Maureen, who, uh, who's been with me since our life journey started in 1972 in high school here in, in Saskatoon. Uh, as you heard, Maureen finished nursing in, in 75. We were married in 76. And uh, yes, we did have Jeff in, a, in our third year. It was a challenge. I'm not sure if there's anybody here from uh, my fourth year class. I haven't been able to see anybody, but we did have uh, study sessions with uh, uh, Jeff on the table, the papers out on the table, and of course the case of beer down beside the table. So uh, we yeah. had. Um, Anne Marine did receive, receive her PhD from the U of S in 1979 as well. Yes, we have two children, Jeff and Carrie, who are here this evening. But I do want to say that through our life, Maureen has been the glue that has really maintained the work-life balance in our family, has supported me 100% along the way. Um, we have been a team uh, to get to this point in our life together. So thank you. <laughs> So, for those that can count, um, this is the 42nd C.J. McKenzie. Marie and I are hitting our 42nd wedding anniversary in May. So, it's, uh, it's coming up quick and the life goes by, doesn't it? Eh? So, tonight I would like to share my thoughts on, uh, on the forces shaping our world today, particularly those that affect the industry that I work in, the electricity industry. I'm sure we are all the same when we think about electricity, but for the most part, we really don't think about it. It's there, it's everywhere, almost like the air we breathe. But like the air we breathe, we kind of miss it when it isn't there. While many places and billions of people in the world do not have access to electricity, we've come to take our elect electricity supply almost for granted because everything we touch, everything we do in Western society depends on electrical energy in some way, shape, or form. It is fundamental to our standard of living, our businesses, and our economies. The future of this industry is going to be transformative, and not just in the integration of new technologies, but in challenging the traditional business model of utilities and energy companies as they develop new customer channels and service offerings to give consumers choice, to meet ever-rising expectations for reliability, security of supply, affordability, and now cleaner electrical energy in our homes and our business. I'm gonna to try to paint a picture for you tonight of the electricity industry in the world and in Canada and at a point or two where I, along with many others, have played a part in helping to shape where we are today in Saskatchewan, and also the path we are on as an exciting future emerges out of that mist before us. So, population growth, increased environmental awareness, and world issues in the 70s and 80s and since have provided platforms for change in energy, energy security, and electricity in North America and around the globe. Let's go back to the 1970s, the decade when I began my studies in engineering at the U of S. While energy efficiency was already underway in the 1970s at the U of S and elsewhere, certain events sparked a renewed interest in the push for energy efficiency for vehicles, homes, buildings, industry, mass transit, etc. For those of you that were there, the 1974 and 1979 uh, energy crisis. The OPEC oil embargo, which resulted in shortages of gasoline and lineups for days at gas stations in the United States and sometimes in, in places in Canada. We remember. In, uh, in 1979, there was the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster. In 1986, we had the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. And more recently, the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan. These three nuclear disaster events each have had the impact of turning the world's populations away from nuclear and looking towards new forms of energy. At the same time, scientific research on matters affecting the environment were taking place around the world. And this research led to international conventions and agreements that have informed government policy and law in, in many, many areas. 
For example, the 1987 Montreal Protocol regarding ozone depletion in the atmosphere. The 1997 Kyoto Protocol, which is actually the COP3, and it was an international agreement linked to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which commits its parties to setting internationally binding greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And more, re more recently, in 2015, in Paris, COP21, after almost 20 years, the world finally comes together to address the now critical issue of global warming and climate change, and targets are set to achieve less than a two degree Celsius temperature rise from pre-industrial levels on Earth sometime in this century. Policy and law inform regulation and direct investment in research and development into new technologies that are ultimately engineered into the fabric of our society. Energy efficient homes, vehicles, and turbine generators in the industry I'm in, for example, have been the result. Every aspect of our lives over the past 40 years at home and at work have been shaped or touched by the move towards an energy efficient future. In the 1980s, in my role as an engineer with the train company, a manufacturer in the HVAC industry, I was involved in the design, selection, and installation of energy efficient mechanical systems and equipment for office buildings, schools, hospitals, and industrial facilities in Alberta and Saskatchewan. In the 1990s, after I joined SAS Power, I was a plant engineer at the Boundary Dam Power Station and then moved on to managing power station maintenance programs. Later in that decade, I led a team investigating distributed generation technologies for the company as distributed generation was beginning to emerge almost 20 years ago. Also in the 1990s, that's when I, I completed my MBA program uh, from 1997 through 1999. My point here is in the industry today, momentum is building, and I believe that we are now moving faster than every, ever before on a number of fronts that over the next 20 to 40 years, we'll see a massive transformation of the electric system from what we know today. So what does that look like? The information that I'm using in this talk tonight is all publicly available information, and I've, just, I've, I've chosen slides that um, look at global issues and then we will distill it down to, uh, to more of a Canadian and, and a Western Canadian focus. <clears throat> so the International Ag Energy Agency identified four large-scale shifts. First of all, renewables will meet 40% of the increase in demand for electricity, and together with natural gas will displace coal generation globally. Rapid deployment of solar in China and India move renewables to 40% of all installed capacity in those countries. Last year, solar installations increased by 50% worldwide as prices fell by over 40% in, in the last two years alone. In the European Union, renewables accounts for 80% of all new generation capacity that's being installed uh, on that continent. As more people have access to electricity in China, India, and Africa, more electrical devices and appliances are sold around the world. The transformation of the power sector is amplified even further by millions of households, communities, and businesses now investing directly in distributed solar photovoltaic, or PV. The third point, as some articles say, when China changes, everything changes. The president of China calls for an energy revolution and a fight against global pollution, and we've all heard the news reports about what's happening in, in China with, uh, with air pollution and, and health issues. The point here is China's choices will play a significant role in determining global trends. On the gas and oil side, natural gas production increases in North America and prices remain low, resulting in increased demand by 2040. The U.S. is already now a net exporter of natural gas, and some forecasts show will be a net exporter of oil by the mid-2020s. And for those of you from the oil and gas sector, uh, you, you probably have much more information than that, but it's, uh, it's an incredible shift in what's happened and it's, it affects the entire North American continent, but the entire globe. So as, as any good presentation, we have an agenda. Uh, we're gonna start with a grid 101. I've always wanted to have, teach university class, uh, so grid, grid 101. <clears throat> uh, we're gonna talk about emissions. We're gonna talk about electrical energy production. Uh, we're gonna talk about the rise of renewables uh, and impacts for Western Canada and, and the emerging path that uh, we seem to be seeing here. And really, my, my point about you know electrical electrical engineering being three wires, how tough can it be? I say that to my guys at, at SAS Power all the time, but uh, with all deference, it's more than three wires. Um, 
The underlying physics and the technology used to build this system that we have in North America over the past 100 years is really essentially the same as when Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla invented electricity and what they called the modern utility uh, well over 100 years ago. One-way one flow of electrons from a generating source through wires that have high conductivity to an end user, which is you and me. This grid has certainly evolved over time and grown to a size that was unimaginable, unimaginable in the 1900s, and system designers and engineers have certainly learned many, many things over the years. Reliability and stability of that grid is key. The North American electrical grid today is a vast interconnected array of high voltage transmission lines that extend from Mexico to the southern US to the northernmost regions of the Canadian provinces. This grid is electrically isolated at certain locations in North America to prevent major faults from propagating through the system and taking out the entire continent. It's sometimes been described as the most complex machine on earth. The lines shown here are 345,000 volts and above, so it appears there are large areas with no transmission lines. However, that is not the case. I'm just going to hit this button. Um, note the major lines, just under the red arrows there, extending north-south from Canada to the U.S., but the absence of similar lines going east-west in Canada. And that's an issue that's under discussion today, and you probably heard about it in the, in the news, and with certain comments the federal government's been making about trying to promote um, east-west movement of energy and, and to, to try to move greener hydro from Manitoba uh, west into Saskatchewan and, and greener hydro from British Columbia into Alberta. Um, we'll get to that in a, in a little while. So in the middle of the continent, if you look in Alberta and Saskatchewan, it looks like there's no transmission lines there at all, but there is. I'll show you in a minute a more detailed view of, of Western Canada. Now, it's important to note that in order to um, operate this grid, uh, each, of the, each, each area of the country is broken up into different regions. Uh, and they are, they're operated in a way to maintain grid reliability and security within that region. There may be several individual generation companies and transmission companies that operate in a region. In the US alone, there's about 190,000 kilometers of transmission line operated by over 500 companies. Over 90% of the industry is privately owned uh, utilities, uh, especially in the U.S., generation companies, transmission companies, and, and a lot of local distribution companies in the U.S. Each of these regions is regulated under what is known as NERC, or the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. This is an industry-led organization responsible for standard setting and guidelines for the operation of the grid so that electric, elect, electrical energy can be moved over vast distances as needed to serve the demand in various areas of the country in a safe, reliable, and secure way. Note that Canada's provinces are part of three different coordinating councils. Um, the Western Electricity Coordinating, Coordinating Council on the west part of the continent, the MRO, Midwest Reliability Organization, where Saskatchewan and Manitoba are members, and the uh, eastern provinces are part of the Northern Power Coordinating Council. This is important to just remember as we, as we go forward. Now here's a picture of uh, uh, the three western provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Uh, the lines that are on this diagram are predominantly uh, 230,000 and 138,000 volt lines. Historically, each jurisdiction or province in Canada has looked after itself as rights to energy security and development were extended to the provinces following confederation. As time went on, each of the geographic areas have built their generation systems to take advantage of the available fuel sources in those areas. So for example, Alberta, rich in oil, natural gas, and coal, Saskatchewan, oil, natural gas, coal, and, and what we call limited hydro compared to the big hydro provinces. And certainly Manitoba uh, has an abundance of hydro with uh, five major river drainage basins uh, moving into Manitoba. And uh, just to put it in perspective, 97% of, of the energy coming out of Manitoba is, uh, is clean or emissions free today. The transmission systems in each province evolved over time to serve the loads in urban, rural, and industrial areas as their economies developed. And I've, I've got the area in red at the bottom, and that, that's been identified as having the best solar conditions and the best wind conditions in the country. The potential is very large for renewables in this region. Now just fast forward a little bit to 2007. I was appointed to be the uh, Vice President of Transmission and Distribution, a mechanical guy that now had to look after the wires, guys. 
And, and we, and I, and I say my team and I, we embarked on a number of strategies intended to keep up with load growth as the economy was moving along, as well as develop a risk-based asset management program for all the line and grid assets in the province, which is a, a big undertaking. I'm going to shift gears now to something that certainly has been in the news lately. Excuse me for a second. The biggest issue facing the globe today is the growing science and the awareness of factors affecting climate change and the potential risks the future world may be faced with. This is a graph of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions up to 2017. As you can see, uh, the rate of growth in worldwide emissions to date is alarming and of course is the subject of many conferences, discussions uh, around the world today. Canada uh, emitted about 750 megatons, which is a million tons, in uh, 2005, which was uh, um, about 2.5% of the world at that time. And in 2015, we emitted slightly less at uh, 723 megatons, which was about uh, 2%, just under 2% of uh, world greenhouse gas emissions. The electricity sector globally accounts for 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. That means 75% of greenhouse gas emissions comes from things other than electricity generation. Important to keep in mind as we, as we think about what this means for, for energy. This slide uh, looks at current and forecast greenhouse gas emissions for Canada and looks out to 2030. Following the, following the Paris Agreement at COP21, uh, Canada had indicated a desire to reduce emissions by 30% in all sectors by 2030. Uh, the Canada's target is in the lower right-hand corner. That's where the target is to achieve the 30% uh, reduction from 2050. The blue line really is the latest track that's been developed uh, for emissions. So you can see there's, there's quite a gap uh, as we go forward. The federal government has moved forward in three key areas that affect all sectors of the economy, but, but certainly does have a direct impact on the electricity sector, especially in Western Canada. Uh, number one is the requirement to establish a carbon pricing mechanism across Canada. Number two is the regulation in Canada which phases out all conventional coal fire generation by the year 2030. And incentives for the transportation sectors to increase the number of electric vehicles for cars, for trucking, and for rail transport. And these issues have certainly grabbed the, uh, the headlines lately. Now, just as an aside, um, I, I had the pleasure of being in Paris at uh, COP21, attending many sessions on the issues and speaking to audiences at that conference on the carbon capture and sequestration project we have built at Unit 3 at our Boundary Dam generating station near Esteban. It was very, very well received uh, at that conference. Now here's a, just a quick snapshot, uh, Canada, uh, Canada greenhouse gas emissions by province. So I've circled Saskatchewan. Uh, we're about number four in Canada after, uh, after Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. Um, and of course, Alberta leads the country in greenhouse gas emissions due, it, due to its oil economy, the oil sands, and, and its large industrial base. Now as we look at greenhouse gas emissions by sector, uh, this slide's worthy of a couple points. When, when the discussion on greenhouse gas emissions begin, most folks automatically think of electrical generation plants uh, because they are big and visible, and they tend to neglect or forget other sectors of the economy. In Canada, for example, it is the oil and gas sector and the transportation sector that accounts for over half of all greenhouse gas emissions in the country. The electricity sector in Canada accounts for about 11% of annual greenhouse gas emissions due to the massive amounts of hydro, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and nuclear generation which uh, exists in other provinces. In Saskatchewan, greenhouse gas emissions for the electricity, uh, electricity sector, or specifically us because we are the electricity sector, were 19% in 2015. And uh, that's the chart on the right, that's Saskatchewan um, greenhouse gas emissions, we're the green in the lower right corner. Um, you can see, well, if you could see it, I'll just tell you. Um, you can see that the ag sector and the oil and gas sector in the province make up 56% of provincial greenhouse gas emissions. And it's an important point to remember that in Canada, we've been very fortunate to be blessed with all the hydro that we have. The electricity sector in Canada is 80% greenhouse gas emissions free today. Now, we're going to shift to um, a 
a slide on world energy production. And I'm not going to ask you to try to find any numbers on here. I just want you to look at a couple things. Number one, the, uh, where we are today is the, is the middle red circle. Um, that's today. As you look out to 2030, which is the next red circle, and, and uh, out, out to 2050, this chart goes out to 2050, you can see the, the increase in world electricity generation that is being predicted. Uh, today we are generating approximately 25, 000, uh, pardon me, 25 million gigawatt hours. Now to, to put that in perspective, uh, Canada's electrical production is only about two and a half percent of, uh, of world energy production. In, in 2030, world forecast is supposed to be 35 gigawatt, uh, million gigawatt hours, and by 2050, it's going to be 60, gigawatt, 60 million gigawatt hours, which is about a 600% increase, or pardon me, 240% increase from today, but a, a whopping 600% increase from 1985, which is just after the, the 70s and the slides I talked to you about the energy crisis. Now, what's important about that is that, well, there's two things about this slide if you look. The, the bottom two colors, the, the lighter blue and the slightly darker blue there, are, are coal production and oil and gas production. Uh, you can see what happens right after 2016, according to this world forecast. This was produced by an independent uh, technical consulting company out of Norway. Uh, it differs slightly from the International Energy Agency uh, predictions. This one uh, is a little more aggressive on the renewables, but uh, you can see the, the decline after, well, from about today, um, as we go out to 2030, a continuing decline in, in coal conventional coal production, and 2050, uh, a significant decline um, in, um, in fossil production. The massive increases, however, are going to come from solar, which is in yellow, and wind, which is in beige. And this is on a world scale. Fossil fuels will supply about 30% of the world electricity in 2030, but it's forecasted to drop to about 10% of world electricity production by 2050, based on current predictions and, and computer modeling that is done by uh, a very sophisticated group. Now, uh, just a caveat on, on these types of forecasts, as I said, um, the International Energy Agency has similar, a similar profile on the overall increase but they're a little less bullish on solar and, and wind. They're, they're suggesting that oil and gas might be a little bit higher than this. Uh, so somewhere in between the two is, is probably where it, it might end up. And uh, there's only, I think the students in the room might be around to tell us, but uh, I might not be around by that time, 2050. When we break that down a bit uh, and look at North American electrical energy production, uh, we see the same kind of profile but you can see in North America today, we're, uh, you know, as a percentage, we're much more heavily dependent on, on conventional coal and, and gas. Uh, the orange band there is nuclear, above that is hydro. But we still see significant load growth uh, into the 2030 and 2050 periods, and a significant part of that is now being picked up by solar and, and wind as well. Uh, today, North America produces about 20% of the world electric, electrical production. But over time, uh, as, as, the world, as the world's production increases, uh, the North American percentage uh, tends to decrease. So by uh, 2050, uh, North America will only be about 11%, which, and if you look deeper into some, some other material that's out there, the rise of electrical generation in China and in India and in Southeast Asia and in Africa is absolutely massive. So the important point to note here is the forecast for renewable energy production rising to about 75% of the energy produced and fossil energy production dropping from about 50% today to about 30% by 2030 and then to 10% by 2050 according to this particular model. If I had a personal opinion on this, um, I might say that other articles might suggest that a percentage of uh, fossils might be a little bit higher than this out to 2050, just given the infrastructure that's in place and uh, the development of, um, of uh, oil and gas fields in, in uh, North America today. So we'll see how that plays out in the, in the future. Um, in 2015, Canada generated... Um, about 13% of North American electrical energy production. 
and Saskatchewan generated about a half of 1% of North American electricity production in 2015. And to my point earlier where those red arrows were going from Canada into the U.S., approximately 10% of all electrical energy produced in Canada is exported to the United States today. The dramatic rise of electricity production in China, India, and Southeast Asia as the world population grows reduces uh, North American electrical production in a dramatic way, as a percentage of global in a dramatic way. By 2050, the world population is expected to be over 9 billion people, up from about 7.4 today. Now, I put on this slide some of the forces that are affecting the electricity sector in Canada, but also uh, around the world. The growing awareness of issues, access to information, and changing de demographics are raising expectations of energy consumers. They want reliable, safe, and secure, affordable, and cleaner than ever before. The second item, 60% of the world's solar panels are manufactured today in China and that is not expected to go down. As China moves rapidly to de deploy solar in their country, prices will drop globally, and access to affordable solar everywhere in the globe will rise dramatically. The third bullet around climate, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, rising concern over climate change are driving federal government regulations, uh, which is accelerating the phase out of emissions from conventional coal, incentivizing electrification of the transport sector, and requiring implementation of a carbon pricing mechanism in all provinces. Uh, lower natural gas in North America. Lower pricing is now, now provides an economic alternative and lower greenhouse gas emissions to conventional coal. The result of low natural gas prices ha has been the retirement of over 50,000 megawatts of conventional coal in the U.S. and Canada in the last five years as these facilities have reached the end of their life. And the last point is very important but not one that's talked about a lot. A society awakens to the issue of climate change it also is affecting where people are choosing to invest their money. Banks, pension funds, investment houses around the world are moving money towards technologies and businesses that have a lower carbon footprint to reduce long-term risk. And because viable business models are now emerging where returns on those investments can now be made increasingly without subsidies. And it's important to note that a lot of the wind development, solar development around the world was subsidized heavily by federal uh, governments uh, around the world and uh, as, as price comes down and those technologies become mature and those industries become mature, those subsidies can start to come off and that's very, very important because now uh, everything competes on an equal footing. The rise of wind and solar uh, renewable generation in Canada corresponds with the rise of these renewables in the rest of the world. Um, in the period 08 to 15, the average cost of wind generation decreased by 40% and solar decreased by almost 80%. In Western Canada, capacity factors for wind turbines continue to climb as towers get higher, turbine technology gets larger and more efficient. Wind capacity factor, and that's usually the, the percentage of time that you can expect to re, uh, achieve any kind of energy production off a wind turbine. It used to be about under 40% uh, only 10 years ago, uh, but with the new technology, it's now approaching 50% in some parts of of uh, good wind regimes in, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Solar capacity factors are lower in the 15 to 20 percent range in that red area that the, uh, in the three provinces. As our northern latitudes receive limited sunshine in winter months at much lower sun angle in the southern U.S., for example, and I know there's probably many of you that are, are deep into this already and understand that science uh, very, very well. On the non-renewable non energy side, this shows the National Energy Board forecast for the increase in natural gas fire generation and the decline in conventional, or, or what's now being called unmitigated coal, out to 2040. Important to point out that unmitigated coal um, refers to conventional coal. Uh, mitigated coal would refer to coal with carbon capture technology, such as we have at our Boundary Dam power station in Estevan. Alberta, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia all rely on both of these fossil fuels for base load generation today. And natural gas, of course, because we can ramp it up and down a lot quicker than we can. Our coal-fired stations is also used to backstop wind and solar as they are intermittent forms of energy. Matter of fact, when we reached uh, peak loads um, on December 29th and peak loads back in the summer here in Saskatchewan, I think our, our wind was only generating uh, in the summertime, I think it was 13 megawatts, um, and on the cold day, coldest day, it was generating something like five. 
So <clears throat> in Saskatchewan, when it gets cold, it gets cold. It also gets very still. So here's what we have done as we get our province on, on a path towards what we call in our corporate vision statement, a cleaner energy future. Now on this part, uh, I will say I'm, I'm proud to have led the strategy development and direction as the president and CEO, CEO on this important path for our company and for the province. All the executive team and many of our planning engineers played a big part in bringing forward a rational and affordable plan for expanding our supply mix with more renewable energy in response to the changing regulatory environment. This plan was approved by our board of directors and has become part of the provincial climate change plan released last year. Our target is a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from our facilities by 2030. Our approach is using more renewables in the supply mix, up to 50% by 2030. Our electricity generation profile out to 2036 is really very, very similar to what you see in the world view and, uh, and the North American view, if you recall. We, we see an increase in load growth over time in the range of 1% to 2% annually, so a little bit flatter than, than the North American curve. But important to note that this forecast and most others do not yet include additional demand expected for the electrification of the transportation sector. So as electric vehicles begin to be integrated into the grid in North America and in Canada um, and in Saskatchewan, uh, it's going to place additional demands um, on the system that are, are just being worked out today. Conventional coal declines as generating units are retired when they reach the, their end of life dates before 2030. All coal plants in this province except one will reach their natural retirement dates before 2030. And in order to meet emissions regulations, they must either be retired and replaced with a natural gas combined cycle generation plant or converted to coal with carbon capture and storage in order to meet the emissions performance standard of 420 tons per gigawatt hour. Uh, which is mandated by the federal government. And that's the same for the for a natural gas unit. As we currently have one unit with carbon capture and storage, and as decisions are made in the other units as we get close to their retirement dates, then on the, the right-hand uh, donut there, the, the gray part is what we call non-renewable, and that's, of course, 50%. Uh, that area will be some combination of coal with carbon capture and natural gas. But at this point, we don't know what the exact mix is going to be, so that's why we just call it non-renewable today. Hydro remains the same, but you can see the percentage of wind increases dramatically over the next 12 years. And we now have a visible yellow uh, section of that donut where, where solar is now um, actually representative on the, on the graph. Solar, another increase, um, although this, is ver this view uh, appears now to be very conservative when it was produced in 2016 as we look at it. And for those of you that have followed uh, recent news reports coming out of Alberta, the price of a wind auction there has resulted in very, very low pricing for wind energy uh, in the order of half of what uh, the industry was expecting just one or two years ago. And uh, we expect this recent pricing uh, in Alberta and pricing that we are about to receive in Saskatchewan to help inform new forecasts for increased options for wind and solar. It's uh, truly remarkable. We're, we're understanding some of the solar pricing is, uh, is significantly lower as well. And uh, we'll be making an announcement probably in the next few weeks on, um, on a successful proponent for the 10 megawatts of, of solar that is just, uh, we, uh, we have been going through the process over the past year. Now, what I've been talking about is solar generation from utilities across and around the world. Uh, this next slide looks at something a little bit different. And this is Saskatchewan residential solar projections out to 2035. These are for installations on people's homes. Uh, so essentially the stuff that is going off grid, I mean, they're, they're still grid connected, but uh, essentially uh, energy that can now be generated by your own uh, privately owned solar panels. And if you have excess, you can put it back into the grid through our net metering program. In 2015, we had about approximately 500 uh, uh, customers uh, with solar panels uh, on the system through our net metering program. By 2025, we project it could be closer to 4,000. And with recent declines in pricing, uh, that could move up uh, rather quickly to uh, maybe 5,000. By 20. Uh, 35, we were predicting close to 20,000 customers, and that's on the, the uh, high sloping green bar there on the right hand side, uh, with the ability to generate from solar and inject it back into the grid in the province. 
So from a utility perspective, this is where the transformation begins to hit traditional utilities as we now have sig significant sources of distributed generation feeding into the grid. Great for the environment, uh, but we will now have to facilitate and ensure that the safe movement of electrons in two ways or multiple ways occurs uh, as opposed to the one-way system, the way the system was designed and has been traditionally operated. And at the same time, revenues for utilities for SAS power will drop in, in this process. So this is the business model impact that I spoke of earlier. And it's, it's going to be a challenge for not only the engineers, but certainly uh, our, the business side of our house as we try to figure out uh, you know, how we can continue to provide value and extract revenue as a utility or change our entire business model into, into something different over the, over the next while. Now, this slide talks about technologies that will affect the grid, and I touched on electric vehicles. There's about 32,000 of them in, in Canada today. They're predicting 50% of all new vehicles by 2030 will be, will be electric. But expansion of the grid will be required for um, the electrification of the transportation sector. Uh, some estimates to, to electrify the transportation sector require the grid, the utility grid, to expand by 50 to 100% across Canada. Now, this will require significant investment that has yet to be determined. Longer term, the successful integration of large-scale renewables will require massive energy storage so that energy can be saved and used when customer demand requires it. Battery technologies are coming of age. Recently, Tesla supplied a 100 megawatt battery storage facility to an Australian utility in just 100 days last year. 100 days. They built it, they tested it, they shipped it, and uh, it's operating. That's just truly amazing. For Saskatchewan and Alberta, the question about nuclear comes up a lot. There continues to be research in this area, but no utility in Canada has an active plan for adding more nuclear at this time. Much work remains to be done. However, there's some promising new technologies out there that are much, much safer uh, than, uh, than the first and second generation nuclear that uh, are, exist in the world today. Finally, companies continue to advance the energy efficiency envelope on all equipment that touches or is part of the grid today, including business and homeowners alike. Opportunities for innovation and challenging work will always be there. Indeed, energy efficiency is still looked at as the biggest opportunity in the world to reduce demand on the electrical grid. Uh, whether it's in North America or Europe or in China and around the world. There is so much work that could be done um, to continue to reduce our consumption uh, and, and thereby reduce the demand on the, on the system. And that's important to remember. So as we look to Saskatchewan, um, whoops, I found this cute little guy with a light bulb on his head. I thought it was appropriate. Um, we're working to understand what protection and control issues could arise with large-scale integration of renewables. Computer modeling of various scenarios are being carried out together with uh, Manitoba hydro engineers, ourselves, and the federal government through Natural Resources Canada. Th that's occurring today. British Columbia and Alberta are also working with NRCAN as they look at um, uh, integrating large-scale renewables. So you begin to see uh, an opportunity where, as I talked about earlier, the potential movement of energy through transmission lines um, west to east and east to west uh, could, could be possible. Much work is left to be done here, but uh, I can tell you that teams are working on it. Uh, one possible solution lies with increased transmission lengths into Manitoba for us that would allow large amounts of clean hydro energy to be moved from Manitoba through Saskatchewan and potentially uh, even into Alberta, but the, the costs for that uh, are, are looking pretty astronomical right now. All these efforts require engineering expertise from many disciplines to resolve the challenges facing the industry. So finally, the customer of tomorrow is going to be unlike the traditional utility customer of today. And that's, that's important to recognize. That customer, whether it be a home, business, or industrial, whether it be a university campus uh, or a brewery, may now be the pr uh, producer of electricity that will flow back into the grid and will need to be safely managed and redistributed. So imagine a world where wind, solar, and battery storage is integrated into every part of our communities, our homes, our vehicles, our future grid. 
Baseload generation could be provided by next generation nuclear and large and small scale hydro and fuel cell technology. Natural gas is a transition fuel gradually reducing over time, say the next 40 to 80 years. I'm not going to predict a, a particular time. I can't uh, find any information where even the experts can, can uh, agree on a, on a particular date. Um, and finally, and the electricity sectors and the transportation sectors, greenhouse gas emissions free by pick a date, 2060, 2080, or certainly by the turn of the century that was the way things are moving. But one of the important things to remember is balancing the cost of keeping pace with population and load growth and making the transformation to this newer, lower carbon future while keeping electricity affordable will be the constant challenge for governments, for utilities, and for the engineers and others who work in this space. I really believe we're up to this challenge, and I look to the future leaders in this room tonight to find them. Now, as any good report does, I've, I've listed my references here for, for the university, okay? Uh, and finally, just a couple final thoughts for the students and future leaders in the room tonight. Uh, sometimes it sounds cliche, but time goes by fast on our journey through this life. So make good decisions each and every day and learn from every experience and every interaction on your path and, and in your career. And secondly, just remember that it's, it's not the position or the money or the trophies that define a person. I believe it's always been about good intention. It's been about character. It's about the contributions that you make in your communities, whether they're big or whether they're small, that will be remembered. The future is yours. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Mike, for, for sharing your knowledge and your insight into the technology that goes into powering our, our world sustainably and, of course, affordably. Um, I know I'm not alone in, in feeling inspired and, uh, and motivated to be an engineer after listening to your lecture. Can we give, can we give Mike another round of applause, please? I now have the pleasure of inviting Dr. David Torvey, head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Saskatchewan, to offer a note of thanks and to present a gift to our distinguished lecturer this evening. As Shante said, I am the head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering here at the U of S, and it's my distinct pleasure to thank Mike uh, for his distinguished lecture this evening. Um, before I do, I'd like to have a few other thanks as well, too. First of all, I'd like to thank Andrew and Shante for the great job they did this evening representing our students and emceeing this event. Um, I'd also like to thank their families for joining us this evening as well, too. And there's many other students who spent many hours over the last few days getting the displays that were over there ready for you and also for helping to, to put on this event, so I'd like to thank them as well, too. Uh, we mentioned the names of the organizing committee. I'd like to thank them again as well, too, on behalf of the department and the college and those of us here, uh, certainly the college advancement team, Carlene, Emily, and Samantha, along with uh, Rick and Ross from our department as well, too, as well as there's many volunteers who helped out and Prairieland Park who hosted us and provided the excellent meal we enjoyed earlier this evening. Now, we said a few times the C.J. McKenzie Gala began back in 1976, and so Mike is the 42nd Distinguished Lecturer. And so this event builds on a, a rich history and, and the efforts of many faculty and staff over the years to make this event what they, it is today. And especially I'd like to thank Mel Hussein, who was one of the people who started off the event back in 1976, and also our distinguished, past distinguished lecturers who joined us this evening as well, too, um, for their support. I'd also like to thank current faculty and staff for their support to the event, including attending tonight, but also encouraging our students to attend. As many people have said, about half the people in the room are students, which is, is, is great um, to hear the talk that was today. 
I'd also like to thank our guests, our generous sponsors, and the many friends and partners of the college who attended this evening and supported the event, and for the, the many ways that you uh, support us throughout the year in many different ways throughout our college. And I know the students especially appreciated the opportunity to talk to the people in industry, alumni and other people, friends of the college, as they sat at the table and, and enjoyed supper together tonight. Now I'd like to thank you, Mike, um, as being our distinguished lecturer this year. And I know I speak for everyone here in expressing our appreciation for the professional and personal insights that you brought today. Uh, the topic was very, um, very important for all of us personally, but also to our province, to our country, and certainly to our college, as, as Mike outlined in, in some of the, the parts of his talk near the end there. But I think also as well, too, Suzanne started us off and talked to the students about engineers can truly change the world. And Mike, in fact, you maybe gave us some examples and inspired your students as ways that they can change the world. I'd also like to mention that Mike um, and other alumni who come back, our students, faculty, and staff very much appreciate when we hear their insights from their, their career uh, professionally, personally, and the like. And I should also note earlier today that Mike gave us uh, two short guest lectures in our design classes in mechanical engineering, our second year design and our third year design. And Mike shared some uh, things about, for example, the value of teamwork to our third year students. To our second year students, he talked about the importance of communications, both technical communication and other communication. And he also answered one student's question about the importance of calculus after you graduate and how much calculus you really use. <laughs> I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Mike's family and friends uh, for joining us today and celebrating Mike's, uh, Mike's career tonight. So this time I'd like to invite uh, Mike to, to join me on stage um, in presentation of a, a gift and a small token of our appreciation as well as Sudan and Andrew and, and Shante. Thank you so much, Dr. Torvey. We really appreciate those comments. Now, like David Torvey uh, had mentioned, a, an evening like this would not be possible without the, the dedication of one of our very own. Um, so let's give a wonderful, warm round of applause for the wonderful work of our events coordina coordinator, Carlene Deutscher, and her, and her team as well. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> We would once, once again like to thank you all for being here tonight to celebrate engineering and the special accomplishments of our very own Mike Marsh. We'd also like to once again thank all of our sponsors because obviously without them this would not be possible. Andrew and I have really enjoyed being your kinetic energy this evening. As in E equals MC squared, kinetic energy equals two MCs. Yeah, yeah, all right, there we go. <laughs> You know what, Shanti, I think I might have had a little bit of a blonde moment there. So thank you for explaining that one. That was good. That's good. So now on that note, that brings our evening tonight to a close. Um, you are most welcome to stay and socialize a little bit longer. The bar will be open till about 1030 and the photo booth at the back will be available for your enjoyment as well. Um, photos from tonight will be posted on the College of Engineering's Facebook page. Um, and make sure as well, always to share your posts to your own social media using that hashtag CJM2018. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Drive home safe and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>